Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming along to the launch of Clifford Lyle's book, The Thin Veneer. Clifford lives in Hereford, where he settled after a long career in which he traveled, lived and worked all over Europe and Australia. His writing reflects his experience of many and varied environments. Mandy Pannett, uh, who is a frequent reviewer of our books, has commented on his ability to evoke atmosphere and mood, especially um, as well as his inventive and witty language. Since returning to live in England, Clifford has published works in several uh, very well regarded magazines, including Acumen, Orbis, Poetry Salzburg Review, London Grip, Dreamcatcher, The Cannon's Mouth, Reach Poetry, The Dawn Treader, and in several Canterbury Festival anthologies. He is a member of the Poetry Society and a local poetry stanza group, and he's blogged for several years on, on writing sonnets. His debut collection, The Thin Veneer, focuses on contemporary issues such as relationships, technology and climate change using traditional po poetic forms. When we received Clifford's poems, we were very struck by his writing on the theme of climate and environmental change. He writes with special conviction and originality about people and societies suffering the effects of global warming and political failure to work to improve the prospects of our struggling world's natural environment. So this evening, we're proud to launch the Thin Veneer with readings by Clifford from the book and from their own work by his guest poets, Derek Sellen and Angela France. This is the book. It's rather well produced, by the way, because uh, Clifford it has got very high standards and he felt it was necessary. And we were glad he made us do it. Flaps. To have flaps. Lovely, solid book. So without any more from me, here's Clifford to read from the first part of The Thin Veneer. Clifford, would you like to unmute and read for us, please? Well, good evening. Can you all hear me OK? Fantastic. Um, well, before I start reading, I think I'd like to say a few words about myself. I was born in Kent, but now live in Herefordshire. And as Janice said, I spent several years abroad. I've traveled, lived and worked in several countries throughout Europe and in Australia. In each country, I took the advantage to hike the many national parks and wild places there. And it was during these adventures that I experienced several memorable, even numinous moments for which there were rarely photographs. So in more settled times, wanting to recollect, to create, I discovered the sonnet, that indivisible expression of a moment. And these days, when I write, I often choose this short form of poetry. So my work now has been published in a number of reputable literary journals. Uh, I participate in local poetry groups and I've written a blog for several years on how to write sonnets. So let's talk about the thin veneer. The works in this book have been five or more years in the making, um, but even some of those five years ago, you'll see still relevant today as they were then. Why this title? Well, open that collection there of sonnets and you'll open a window on all that stands between civilization and ourselves and its loss, the thin veneer. The veneer of civilization has always been thin and many regional civilizations have risen and fallen, but civilization now faces a global and existential threat. So in this collection, I wanted to explore themes such as the fragility of our existence and relationships, 
the power of nature, the impact of technology, and the climate breakdown using traditional poetic forms, and especially the sonnet. I wanted the poems to be universal, focusing on human condition and our need for humility in the face of the implacable power of nature. The cover and the photograph you see in the background behind Janice there, that's based on a photograph that I took in the New South Wales Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area. And this is now UNESCO protected bushland. In each of these 14 lines of fractures, the sonnets, you'll read of loss, jealousy, betrayal, of solitude, and those moments between life and death. The book's divided into four sections, life, relationships, society, and civilization. And I'll cover each of these in turn. The first section, life. When I was young, I remember reading a quote by the mountaineer, Eric Shipton, which motivated many of my adventures. He said, there are few treasures of more lasting worth than the experience of a way of life which in itself is wholly satisfying. Such, after all, are the only possessions of which no fate, no cosmic catastrophe can deprive us. Nothing can alter the fact if for one moment in eternity we have really lived. It's the expression of these moments, sometimes numinous, that make good subjects for sonnets. I lived in Sydney for many years, and Australia is notable in having an urban Western civilization in close proximity to national parks with wilderness areas. And I spent much time hiking in this summer, sometimes perilous bushland. Eight of these poems in the book are set in this country in Australia, and others are set in North America, around Europe, and in New Zealand. However, not all the poems are autobiographical. Indeed, rather than set in actual locations, some poems are allegorical, and it's for you, the reader, to find your own interpretations. In this first section, Life, there's a focus on moments between life and death, when nature could be about to overwhelm an individual, but sometimes leaving the outcome ambiguous. I'd like to open with my first poem, an allegory about the transience of life and the need, as Shipton says, to seize the day. This very short poem is in two parts. It is called At the Tumbleweed Diner. Daybreak. From the farthest booth, you can gaze out at dust devils. By the window there, you sit on the shore of a burning day. A corvette slumbers in the dawn light, caught in fish bones of the car lot beyond the unbound scrubland. You feel the bitter hug of your first coffee, bottomless, catch the glint of a jetliner's trail, silver sum of a hundred lives departing. You hail a waitress as she glides by. Sundown. Over the car lot, Figments of lanterns hang, hanging in the glassed off murk. You savour the mood, a burgeoning quiet. In this moth light, you tip your mug. Deepen the dregs, a bystander to the black top. The corvette's gone, faces forgotten. Ketchup stains and coffee rings remain. 
a waitress wheels out a pail and mop. The next poem is inspired by a photograph taken by that great American landscape photographer, Ansel Adams. It's called Looking West Across Snake River to Grand Teton Mountains. No witness but me to this wreck of heaven, fallen in a cloud crash of blue marbled ice. Fixing this scene, I scan titanic spires. Down those sheer crags a man would drop for 10 seconds, a moat of screaming life. I watch eagles soar, 10 minutes, thermaling up. I clatter out my tripod, set the shutter, the lens to wide angle, wipe off a smudge, waiting. Clouds my seconds, scudding showers my minutes, wool shirt sticking on cold sweat. My sky will be perfect black, ice fields white. This my last ascent, no want of reminders, the struggling for breath. Then in the viewer, perfection, this study of solitude. Thank you. So the last poem in the first section of life is called Snowbound. Starving. My last hot meal was just warm porridge. I climb with crunching boots through pristine snow and past the refuge, following yellow poles, a headache of haste before the pass closes. My tunnel of garb flaps as the wind strengthens. It comes galumphing down from icebound peaks and then vents as if there was a tear in heaven, buffeting my cupped match of body heat. Across these crumpled rags of hills that spread all the way to winter, threadbare and old, I struggle on with a less certain tread. Under an acetylene scant sun, yet cold, I stagger, kick icy feathers like a clown, then lay my head and soul on weightless down. Thank you. The next section, entitled Relationships, focus on one of those underlying characteristics of society, the relationships between people. And here the poems speak of breakups, betrayal, loss, solitude and makeups. The first poem is about solitude and it's called Enduring Solitude. Not one word had passed my lips since dawn broke. I roamed that winter park of beasts alone, past empty pens, while through a stand of pines swept a whispering wind, sharp as broken bone. Between the slut, the stark, sleet, wet columns, I glimpsed bison like some far archipelago, their moist eyes dully leaking out their lives, the herd not heeding if I stay or go. At dusk, I sat inside a vaulted cafe of leather, candles, linen and champagne, and other singles caught in mirrors mused their fate. Should I go 
or perhaps remain. Not a word, not one utterance since dawn. Then a waitress asked me, why so forlorn? The next one's called, a seamstress considers her options. The trap awaits outside, its horse a bay, jangling its traces by dank stone walls. With her income gone, life has spun away like moonbright shillings dropped down a well. Before a mirror and peonies, red as her nightmares, she begins her theater of poisons, gathers her powdered white lead and black moon-shaped patches of taffeta. She mouths a humid oath, then covers her scars, touches rouge to her lips, feeling the pink sting. There, ready, she thinks, but her shaking marks the proximity of panic and skin. For the lamp-lit stage, the candle-lit trysts, for the age-old trap that men can't resist. Called jealousy. Once bingo, now a ballroom, the Folkestone lease, on stage the judges sat like four front teeth. Now only the best of the couples remained. My wife, you were cool as a waltz in the heats, crossing parquet all polish and silvery rain like the sweep of a taffeta sunbeam. I stood out with two left feet, no tuxedo. Between each dance, I polished up your heels. In the Latin, the shadowy faces, beguiled by your bonfire of passions, your partner's vain tango by the sequined audacity, fake tan and smiles, didn't see him seduce with his hips to and fro. At each climactic lift, his hand would linger behind your back, all gypsy rings and fingers. Thank you. Oh, that's brilliant. That last of gypsy rings and fingers. <laughs> Beautiful reading. Thank you very much. And we will we'll now have uh, some work from Derek. Derek Sellen has been writing poetry, stories and plays over many years. He's read his work widely in the UK, Italy, Germany, Russia in better times and Ireland, and has won various poetry awards, including Poets Meet Politics, The Oveil Five Words and the Canterbury Festival. His poem, Putin and the Stewardesses, was recently highly commended in the Plough Poetry Competition 2022. His collection of poems, in, inspired by Spanish art, which is called The Other Guernica, Guernica, Guernica published by Cultured Lama in 2018, was a finalist in the Poetry Book Award 2020, and it was very positively reviewed in Poetry Salzburg, London Grip, and other places. He's also provide, co provided co cover illustrations for Fiona Sinclair's collections, one of the poets that we've, other poets that we've published, including her recent book, which is called uh, Second Wind, which we published last year. So, Derek, could you read us some poetry? Thank you, and uh, thank you, Clifford. Um, like moon bright shillings drop down a well. That's a fantastic line, thank you. Um, right, I'll start with um, Weeping Woman, which is uh, inspired by the uh, painting by Picasso that I, you probably all know. Um, and I wrote this a few years ago when there was the war in Syria. And um, unfortunately, it's still relevant uh, now that there's war in Ukraine. Um, the poem refers to certain incidents in the life of Dora Ma, who was the model for the painting. Weeping woman, she sings and dances, scars on her brow, 
wearing her patched dress and her crazy hat. I fashioned art and lived as I wished, she said, but that was before I was sent to the clinic where they seared my brain and inscribed me with fear. We glimpsed her from far at the school where gunfire haunts the air, at the abattoir and the gorgeous cemetery in a secret pit, at the tower where a hundred died in a fire, and the shrine where the children were killed by a drunk in a car. I am the weeping woman. Life has misused me, she said. My eyes are gummed by the congealed tears of all the years. I don't know anymore what sorrows are, she sang. My sorrows belong to you, she sang. She was seen again by the charred ruins of Mariupol, each gaunt facade framing a home hollowed by war. Thousands on thousands lost, she sang, and just for power to be held. From Guernica to here, the dead are all kin of mine. I am la femme en pleur. I follow the sadness because I must. I once was one of you. Um, can you hear me okay? I, I had something flash up that uh, the internet was unstable. But no. um, My second poem is called Layla. It's um, inspired by the old Arabic Persian tale about Layla and the poet. And um, I've, um, without permission, I'm afraid I, I've given it a twist. Layla. Her father said she'd be a good wife. And she would have been, but for the poet. She was young and flattered, with no defences against the words that spun her into their song. Out of the dark of the yard at night, his wailing chant, it was a voice that pursued and possessed. Even the dog sat and listened in a circle. He woke the house. They called crazy curs, madman stalker. By day, he led a hermit life, lurking in the desert and in their minds. Her husband fettered her with suspicion. Now that her illness brews, the poet sings of a heart that ails. Her thoughts reach out across the sands. Let me be, a tumour kills me, not passion, but more night lyrics blossom. She sweats her sick bed black and closes ears, he wants to heal me with kisses, to immortalize my dying. Two men's fantasies pinion her as her husband hovers, watch her at the pillow, alert for her death. She thinks he needs to hear firsthand whether it's his name or the poet's that's last out of her lips. Layla, she will howl, claiming back her stolen soul. And the uh, next poem is um, also about a woman, or, although in this case it's a man and a woman, uh, Benny and Betty Fox, who were sky dancers, as they were called, who performed in the 20th century in the USA, way above the streets. Um, and in fact, the Bet Betty Fox, um, over the years, she was replaced several times. So there was more than one Betty Fox. Betty Fox is skipping on 18 inches of perch, 20 stories above the buzz and dystopia of the street. The rope skims her head, heels skim the rope, toes touch down and rebound. Perhaps she'd rather this than the blindfold waltz or the famous death whirl. Indianapolis to Miami, depression to Cold War, her crowds gasp. She springs high, does mid-sky splits, angel in an ice blonde wig. The name is leased. Decades of nimble women renew Betty Fox, aerialist. Dapper but gray, Benny debuts the latest. She clamps her thighs on his waist and leans out into the swallowing air closing her blue eyes as if she falls asleep. 
He sees all the Bettys, ghosts of one another, slipping from him as he begins to spin. And my last poem is, uh, it's from the other Guernica, and it's a poem that Clifford said he liked, so uh, I will read this, and uh, it's a sonnet, if I can find it. Um, it's called, We Met Him on the Road, and it's inspired by a poem by Alonso Cano, um, rather an underappreciated Spanish painter. Um, and he, his painting the road to Emmaus shows the disciples meeting Christ on the road. And um, it's, in my opinion, it's a marvelous painting, I think. We met him on the road and turning, facing, we seem to dance, a step forward, a step back, a curve of the arm, a flexing of the soul, an uplift of the palm. Fingers splayed, an involuntary response to the moment, as if our arcing bodies knew, before our minds did, who it was we hailed. This was the man we'd seen speared and nailed, now greeting us. We exclaimed together, you. Carno imagines it so, gives the men's mad tale, skin, bone, tendon, ripple of robe, silver of hair, gives his Christ a gleam, as if the atoms of his flesh buzz to be free, to loosen and disperse in death. He bows with a grace, sees into them with his stare, invites them where paint strains to follow, beyond the real. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Very vivid poems. The story of Betty Fox is amazing. Yes. I hope none of them died. They just got old, I suppose. They, they did, yes. Uh, no, I don't think any I of them I think you'd have heard died. otherwise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was lovely three poems. Thank you very much. Um, and we're going to go back to Clifford now, and Clifford's going to read from another part of The Thin Veneer. Thank you, Derek. That was great. And I'm moving now on from the life and uh, relationship section onto the third section, society. And looking at some of the tensions in society that we, we have and that may even increase as uh, climate change becomes more prevalent. Things like poverty, unemployment, homelessness, factionalism, protest, and I've picked a selection of uh, three or four poems, which I hope I've got time to read. I think I've got 10 minutes for this. I'll be finished before then, I think. The first one I wrote many, many years ago, um, and then looked at it and thought, well, it's actually still relevant. And it's a villanelle called Storms Across Europe. <clears throat> Blowing hot, all high pressure since last week, but snowstorms then surged past the calm Azores. Blowing cold, all signs show the outlooks bleak. El Pais flutters with news of yesterday. Skull-like villas gaze out on silent shores. Blowing hot, all high pressure since last week. A steel-hued sea freights in a nor'westerly. It skirts the crowded shamrock. Rattling doors, blowing cold, all signs show the outlook's bleak. The waiters, idle, all strop and lethargy, near the Parthenon, in the new agoras. Blowing hot, all high pressure since last week. Yells from bingo halls, distract the elderly from storms that scour this town of discount stores, blowing cold, all signs show the outlook's bleak. Politicians talk, briefed so expertly, they'll finish soon, the BBC assures, blowing hot, all high pressure since last week, blowing cold, all signs show the outlook's bleak. Thank you.
The next poem is called Running Fifth Avenue. On this island off the coast of itself, in high acres of glass, the cloud are trapped while shive light gleams through the silos of cash. He stares, standing on the sidewalk, a deep well of vertigo, a matted blanket wrapped around his shoulders, no scraps in the trash. Poised with violent eyes like a black bear, people pass. In that old light of slow blues, all of their shoes teem past like river salmon. Envy possesses him, creeps from its lair. He spies a girl's purse, the leather strap loose. She's silver sunlight on the stream of Maman. For her, that ardent morning had begun so well. He fixes his prey, then he runs. I once read this next poem out to a group and there was a young person in it who thought that a doodlebug was an insect. And I think the assembled company um, understand what it was in World War II, so I don't need to explain any further. And that's the name of this poem. A carriage clock, it ticks above the fire. Smells of coal tar soap mixed with chimney smoke. A kettle exhales, hob hot on gas jets, clouding up the garden view where raindrops burst in marquisite pools, but not one sound disturbs the placid room. Photos arranged on shelves, a lamp lit to fend off nightfall. Here stands a wireless, a model spitfire, threadbare armchairs that reek of cigar smoke. High tea is set, a vase as black as jet, with long stemmed roses, faded. A petal drops. Far overhead, a droning engine sound, insignificant. Muffled by the rain, it sputters out, then silence falls. Seen through a prism of people. A busy road quarrels with the fractious heat, snaps back at a tap of snares, throb of a song, as waves of protesters pulse through the street, buoyant chests and flashing teeth of all ages, a rapture of young lungs, knowing they're not wrong. Banners unfurl like eels, flyers like lures. We see others in their littering wake, touts, hawking t-shirts, and partially obscured, heavier men with bottles itching to fly. From their angry placards, they have no doubts. The grammar of their grievance stops debate. But mannequins observe with shop-soiled eyes, while CCTVs glare with glass and hate, imprinting one truth of the many lies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clifford. That was the doodlebug one is quite I remember my grandparents talking about those. I was I was born not long after the war, months after the war, but uh, it, it must have been very it must have been terrifying that silence while you waited. Yeah, brilliant. And now we'll go to Angela. Angela France has had poems published in many leading journals and has been anthologized a number of times. Her publications include Occupation, by, uh, published by Ragged Raven Press in 2009, Lessons in Malimoroki, Nine Arches Press, 
2011. Hyde, published by Nine Arches Press in 2013. And The Hill, uh, again, Nine Arches Press in 2017. The Hill was developed into a light, live multimedia poetry show, which Angela toured, funded by the Arts Council in England. And her latest collection, Terminarchy, Terminarchy, was published by Nine Arches Press in July last year, 2021, and launched at Ledbury Poetry Festival. She has an MA in Creative and Critical Writing and a PhD from the University of Gloucestershire. Angela teaches creative writing at the University of Gloucestershire and in various community settings. She runs a reading se series in Cheltenham called Buzzwords. And if you look in the, uh, in the, the chat, uh, if you're here live, you will see where uh, the, uh, the URL of Buzzwords. And Clifford will be reading there in Cheltenham in September this year, 2022. So very exciting uh, to hear from you, Angela. Thank you very much. Please unmute. Thank you. And thank you for asking me. Um, first of all, congratulations to Clifford. Huge congratulations and to his publishers for publish, putting out such a lovely book. Um, as Clifford said, he has been working with me on the seminar series run by the Poetry School, and it is always a pleasure to work with people that are serious about poetry. Um, I'm sorry you won't hear Leslie, because she is well worth listening to, but perhaps you'll get to hear her another time. So I'm going to read four poems. W.H. Auden famously said, poetry makes nothing happen. Poetry makes nothing happen. Let it make nothing happen more this year, so that a young girl whose mail arrived arrives early and read a book she's waited for over breakfast and find a poem with blue depths and points of light which she tastes in the back of her throat on the way to work and walks a little slower than usual so that nothing happens as she crosses the road because the guy in the four by four who's answering a call on his mobile already passed by or so that a fighter sits up almost all night reading roomy trying to understand death and blood, peace and love, and sleeps too late to be ready for the knock at the door, so tells them he'll follow after because he wants to hold his son and play with his daughter, and nothing happens as he kisses his children because he isn't in the car when a government missile hits it. Also that a man, sleepless and pacing, picks up a book from his wife's bedside and reads a poem casually but finds lines stuck in his mind like burrs on a wool sock, like when he used to spend out weekends relaxed and outdoors, so he holds back on giving an order and extends credit on a couple of loans so that nothing happens to a lot of people that day who carry on going to work and never even know that nothing happened. And um, I believe that the poet's job is to pay attention to everything around us, large and small. But in these times, paying attention is hard. There's a lot going on. Scrolling. Carefully, I sought recycling on my knees. Each bottle chink in the bag or silence of plastic in the box feels like a plea, a prayer. The crowd's insistence on guilty clicks on sad or angry faces dilutes the, the true significance of the scrolling pictures, the glacial cracks and carvings, rainforest fires, storms and floods, endless pages of drowning refugees, tired rescuers carrying blooded babies from bombed houses, scared children sleeping rough in rich cities. Scrolling feels like vertigo. Hearts and kittens don't dilute constant crises and paying attention is like the stark brilliance of winter sun on a wet road. All I see ahead is the shape of something dark. Uh, but paying attention can also bring small joys. And this particular small joy, I unexpectedly brought home with me from the garden center in a pack of park chippings. Suddenly, a frog. 
an egg sliced corner to corner, allowed the wet bark to spill, separate into wedges, spread from a compact block to a glistening heap. The frog clambers up from the dark chippings. Piano-fingered hands spread to grip bark as it shifts and slides, pauses on top of the pile. I can see its throat pulsing, perfect dots along sharp back ridges, cleanly banded legs in Halloween rich stockings. Suddenly, the taste of envy, to slip into stasis, to lie still in darkness, protected from unexpected upturning resulting bumps and bruises, to not know time passing and to emerge unsullied, blinking at a new day, perfect. And the last one, um, the title of the, this book I have been asked about, Terminarchy. Uh, Terminarch is one of the two words for the last of any species. The other word for the last of a species is endling, which is the title of this poem. The book was going to be called um, Endling, and then an American poet got there before me. So I didn't want hers coming up on Google instead of mine. <laughs> it's, um, so it became Terminarchy, because I'm thinking Terminarchy in the sense that you think of oligarchy, patriarchy, you know, are we heading for a Terminarchy? And the when I was researching some of the animals we've lost, I came across such wonderful names um, that I haven't managed to fit them all into the poem. Poems, names such as the gloomy tube-nosed bat. And there is a peculiar sort of grief and guilt that these wonderful things have gone from our lives before I even knew of them. But as I say, the, the greatest drive in nature, the imperative in nature is to reproduce. And so the thought of being the last of any species um, is just terrible that they will continue to look and never find. So this is Endlings. Oh, I should also explain there's a voice at the end from Sparrow. Sparrow speaks up through this book time and again. It's not Sparrow the bird. I'm not entirely sure what he is, but he's become a sort of eco-conscience who pipes up in various poems through the book. Endlings drift over the earth, gather in loose clusters, their calls echo and cease. Predators ignore their prey, run together, scan and scent the ground on hill and heath, in widening circles until resigned they lay down alone. The thylacine doesn't try, he's released both need and drive, has given up and found a place to lie still as he blurs and fades to become just a shadow on the ground. On a branch above, the passenger pigeon waits, her claws no longer able to uncurl, Tree bark patterning feathers as if braided in mist. Tattered butterflies whirl between leaves, don't settle or rest passed over by birds. The laughing owl, the forest thrush, circle the sky, possessed by an older, greater need, and scarred by hope until exhaustion brings peace in death. A Barbary lion calls in the hills unmarked, and sparrow weeps for the want of an arc. Thank you. Andrea, that was such a privilege to hear those poems. They're beautiful, fantastic. Fantastic. In fact, I'll have to buy your book. Thank you. <laughs> it's uh, the last one was from Terminarchy. Were the, what, what were the others? Where, were, where did the others appear first? Sorry? Were the they, they, all the poems that all those poems are from Terminarchy? Oh, good. Right. Lovely. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. So, and now, Clifford, can we hear from you again? Angela, thank you very much for stepping in at the last moment and uh, reading from Tamanaki. And it's quite appropriate that that book shares similar themes to, to the thin veneer. Yeah. Uh, many of the poems in this book use traditional form, like sonnets. So for those perhaps not so familiar, I just want to say a few words about sonnets. It's, it's a form that's been used for hundreds of years, originally to express loss and love, but more recently increasingly used for contemporary subjects. And many of the sonnets in this book are modern sonnets that follow to a lesser degree the established rules. 
they nearly always have a turn of events or mood about just over halfway through. And typically a sonnet has 14 lines saying just enough and no more. I love the concision of a sonnet. It's a, it's a good discipline, which can create an intense emotional effect through the juxtaposition of ideas. So in the final section of Thin Veneer, Civilization, I'm focusing on the impact of technology and also the effect of climate breakdown on our Western civilization. In addition to the proximity of national parks and wildernesses, Australian lifestyles also lie on the front line of the climate breakdown. You'll all have heard recently of the bushfires and floods and I'm sure my awareness of the issues arose from the period that I spent in that country. So this section of the book includes poems that are a personal response to that threat. And I'm going to read three. The first is called The Promise of Magic. All eyes are on the high wire act, none on the wires as she twist twirls to screams of delight. Below the crowds are gorging on fun and candy floss in darkness lanced by beams of spotlights. Trailing cables coil, humming like wasps in the wings where scaffolds of magic gleam where foremen count out coins for clowns and tumblers. On a horizon, left a ajar for dawn, cumulus promise floods as he walks his dog across the downs. Barking breaks the morning's newly minted stillness. Halfway to briar seams, his border collie has found not his stick of dog spit and dew, but some menace. Faces of clowns on flyers, flattened ground, the grass as dead as the big tops promise. The next one is called Terra Incognita. This is God's own country he says to his son through fierce tears, but the terracotta dirt is dry as clinker. A leafless ghost gum fingernails the sky as insectile heat enfolds him, intimate as death, feasting on sweat. Out of sight in his scungy kitchen, his tap drips once. From out of the hot nowhere, a zephyr swirls. A fly screen door bangs. His rows of wheat lie like flat, lie flat like torn up shrouds. Each full dark, the empty dingoes stray in, tongues lolling, their tattoo of want a necklace round his house. He whispers to his son, never seen the like of this but his son is out, a trucky hauling water to the towns. Thank you. Last poem, although not the last in the book, which I'll come to in a moment, is called Litterpick. Dressed in high vis, we wade on, black sacks bunched up a glass percussion of jars and jangling tins through stubbled fields the river witters past it clutches our calves tells us lurid tales of burst banks and ruins we poke the nettles with pickers for plastic hung out as prayer flags shattered bottles like jewels scattered from rotted coffins we banter about our score, our tally of bags. With a pulley, heave out shopping trolleys buried in ferns. 
the undertow like some rising tsunami under silken shrouds drags us downstream a surge foams around a rusted bike the river turns around a bend a tipping point reveals to us all its works we arrive at a stone bridge collapsed a pile up of cars some overturned our mood dies in a funeral of smiles no sighs of survivors our discarded sacks float on like black swans i telephone an sos in the wreckage a hyundai and its driver not driving her gray tresses billowing dead as a dress um, there is one there is another poem one more poem at the end of the book called the arrow of time and it, it basically asks it whether we can rewind events perhaps giving the hope of fixing now what needs to be fixed and and leaves the reader with a perhaps a, a grain of hope you know is it too late as some think but I'll, I'll let you read that one thank you um, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people my wife Gillian Angela France, Sonia Overall, Derek Sellen, Mandy Panett, Jan Paul, Peter Eschmeyer, Sanjay Kaladin, Nessa McLean, and of course, Janice, Donal, yourselves, my publishers. Thank you so much for your interest. Thank you. <laughs>